as the president of Iceland for 20 years and is known for his advocacy of environmental issues. It was during his term in office that Iceland became a leading center for research into and the development of alternative energy. He now serves as chairman of the Arctic Circle, which he founded in 2013 with various Arctic partners. The Arctic Circle Assembly, held in Iceland every October, is now the largest annual international <coughs> gathering of the Arctic, which is attended by more than 2,000 participants from 60 countries. Today's panel also includes Mr. Suresh Reddy, Additional Secretary, Europe, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, who will give us his remarks on the uh, topic. Mr. Reddy has had a distinguished career when he, after he joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1991 and currently is coordinating India's engagement with Europe and Central Asia. We also have Dr. Vijay Kumar, scientist and advisor with the Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India. Mr. Kumar has been working with the Ministry for, as an advisor in the past few years. He's looking after programs pertaining to polar science and cryo. Uh, Chirosphere, comprising of India's Antarctic program, Arctic program, Southern Ocean program, Himalayan program, water cycle, ocean survey, and mineral resources. And he is also looking after India's acquisition of new polar research vehicles. May I now request Director General, Indian Council of World Affairs, Dr. T. C. A. Raghavan, who will be chairing the session, to kindly give his welcome remarks. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your <coughs> presence here today. Uh, Mr. Olafur Ragnar Grimson, former president of Iceland, chairman of the Arctic uh, Council, Ambassador Suresh Reddy, Dr. V. Uh, Vijay Kumar, Ambassador of Iceland to India, His Excellency Mr. Gunmunda Arni Stephenson, the Ambassador of India to Iceland, Armstrong Jankson, distinguished guests, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to have you all uh, with us uh, today. And may I begin by thanking His Excellency uh, President Grimson for coming all the way to talk to us about uh, a subject which is very evidently emerging as something of great uh, importance. As I mentioned to him uh, a few minutes ago, his presence here has enabled us to uh, try to catalyze a greater interest uh, in the Arctic and bring together scholars and scientists from across uh, the country to attend both this lecture as also the seminar which uh, uh, follows it. Uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs was established uh, some years before our independence by a fraternal group, a small fraternal group really, of public intellectuals and scholars who thought it was important <coughs> that India develop an independent perspective. And they used to use the term an Indian perspective uh, on world affairs. Since that time, this institution has evolved and changed a great deal, but it has remained three, uh, it has remained three, it has retained three principal uh, pillars. Uh, firstly, a platform for engagement with other countries and other institutions. Uh, secondly, as a center for research, and finally, as an entity with a mandate to expand the foreign policy community within the country. In other words, to, to deepen the debate about imp important international uh, issues within, it, within India itself. Engaging with and informing public debate about emerging and important international issues is therefore very much part of our beat. And in that context, we are the very grateful and privileged to have with us his Excellency Olaf R. Grimson, uh, former President of Iceland, with us. Uh, he is also, as you know, Chairman of the Arctic Council, and he is going to speak to us uh, today about a subject which really is at the intersection of uh, three emergent uh, disciplines, uh, uh, geostrategy, geoeconomics, and of course, climate uh, change. As I said, his presence has enabled us to uh, try to catalyze greater interest uh, in uh, the profound and uh, uh, remarkable change which is uh, taking place in the Arctic. That change is uh, very evidently uh, 
encapsulated by uh, the fact that it is warming, that region is warming uh, twice as fast as anywhere else uh, on this planet and is transiting from being permanently ice covered to seasonally uh, ice free. The issues this throws up are the subject of uh, 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 President Grimson's lecture and also the seminar which would uh, uh, follow. But India's engagement with this uh, area is uh, of uh, great importance. In 2013, <coughs> uh, four Asian countries beside India were granted observer stated in the Arctic Council, India, Japan, South Korea, and uh, Singapore being the others. Uh, I do hope the lecture today and the seminar which will uh, follow will enable us to uh, develop uh, a more sustained and uh, consistent interest in this important uh, area of uh, foreign policy, of uh, international economics, and most of all, the emergent uh, changes, the, si the science of climate change. Uh, with these uh, remarks, may I again thank all of you here for your presence here today and thank in particular uh, Mr. Suresh Reddy for finding the time also to be with us. Thank you very much. I now please request Sri Suresh Reddy, Additional Secretary, Europe, MEA, Government of India, to give his remarks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I join Ambassador Raghavan in extending a very, very warm welcome to His Excellency Dr. Grimson, uh, Ambassador Raghavan, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar, and I'm happy to see our distinguished ambassadors from Iceland, Russia, and of course Czechoslovakia here, along with our ambassador to Iceland, uh, friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests. <coughs> uh, I'd really like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Olafu Ragnar Grimson, a distinguished leader and if I may say so, a good friend of India. In fact, is we were just having a discussion and he was mentioning that his in first meeting in India was with Madam Indira Gandhi, going back to 1983. And it was really a privilege to hear his experiences over the years. And importantly, the last two visits which he paid to India was in his capacity of the President of Iceland, and for which we are again grateful that he took the time to visit India, and which laid the foundations for a strong bilateral relations and also which led to the opening of the missions in both the capitals. Uh, though Madam <coughs> Musaif Grimson is not here, I'd like to extend her also a very warm welcome, Excellency, and I wish her also a very pleasant stay in India. <coughs> I had the privilege of visiting Iceland in 2005, when we had the historical visit of uh, President Abdul Kalam took place. And I still have fond memories of the visit and of the excitement which surrounded the visit of Dr. Kalam and mainly due to Dr. Grimson, who gave personal support to that visit. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Arctic Circle that has been established by Dr. Grimson is a non-profit, non-partisan organization which was established in 2013. It hosts its signature annual assembly in October and has the largest annual international gathering on the Arctic, attended by more than 2,000 participants from 60 countries. Today, it has become the premier forum for all stakeholders involved in promoting dialogue and cooperation on the future of Arctic. Not many are aware that our engagement in Arctic dates back to 100 years when India became a signatory to the Svalbard Treaty, courtesy UK, in Paris on 9th February 2020. Uh, later, we established Himadri, the research station, in 2007, and subsequently in 2013, India became an observer status, uh, India became an observer in the Arctic Council. And again, I would like to thank Dr. Grimson for the active support extended by him personally during that period in 2013 in enabling India to become an observer in the Council. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the discussions surrounding Arctic are centered around broadly five areas, economic and commercial opportunities, scientific research, geostrategic and transportational interests, impact of climate change, and legal and governing issues. The importance of Arctic to India arises from the same set of factors. Evidently, the importance of each is no less than the other, and all are equally relevant, with significant impact on each other. The theme for today's discussion is India's engagement with the changing Arctic, and <clears throat> this leads us to the question, what has changed 
and how to shape India's response to those changes. There are three fundamental changes that appear to be happening and I believe of direct relevance to India. When India signed on to become an observer to the Arctic Council, one of the requirements was to recognize state sovereignty, sovereign rights and jurisdiction in the Arctic. Another requirement was to recognize that an extensive legal framework applies to the Arctic Ocean, including the law of the sea, and that this framework provides a solid foundation for responsible management of the ocean. Hence, India naturally has a direct interest in how the members of the Arctic Council manage these changes. The first change is that the Arctic has become the new El Dorado, the land of opportunity and resources. Reportedly, the surface below the Arctic holds 13% of the world's undiscovered oil, 30% of its undiscovered gas, an abundance of rare earth minerals, and millions of square miles of untapped resources. Second is the emergence of the new sea lanes and the potential to become new Panama Canal or Suez Canal, boosting commercial and economic exchanges between Asia and Europe and beyond. The related aspect is the determination of the members of the region to assert national sovereignty over the sea lanes. Third is that the Arctic Ocean is rapidly taking on new strategic significance with the concept of Arctic exceptionalism being challenged. It is emerging as a region dominated by competition, then cooperation for power and resources. The question that emanates from this is the role of the Arctic Council and importantly, its ability to ensure a cooperative approach to the critical issues that confront the region. Another area of serious concern to India is the adverse impact of climate change in the Arctic. The IPCC has estimated that Arctic will have an ice-free summer by the end of this century. A few recent studies have indicated this might happen earlier by 2030 or 2040. The related element is the impact of the Arctic on the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, widely known as the Third Pole. This region has the largest reservoir of snow and glaciers outside the polar region. The, North Arctan, uh, the Northern Arctic Oscillation has a direct impact on Indian agriculture through the monsoon and indirectly it impacts the hundreds of millions of people dependent on agriculture. The challenge is that this exploration for resources or uh, opening of sea lanes or the strategic competition is the one which is also going to impact the, uh, the, uh, the Arctic directly and indirectly India also. In this context, it is worth noting that India's position with the Arctic Council and Arctic Forum has put us in a better position to understand these changes and shape the responses to mitigate these high efforts, effects. We have clearly articulated our position, stating that we are closely following the developments in the region with interest and have expressed our willingness to play a greater role in the Arctic Council in partnership with our friends in the Council. Excellency, in conclusion, the Arctic states have approached the Arctic on the principles of individual sovereignty, voluntary cooperation and shared responsibility. Hence, we look forward to the Arctic states managing this transition to best serve interests of all, both the people of the region and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. May I now request Mr. Vijay Kumar to kindly give his special remarks. Thank you. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Grimson, uh, former president of Iceland and uh, chairman of the Arctic Circle, and as rightly described by Mr. Reddy, friend of India. Uh, Mr. Shiresh Reddy, additional secretary of Europe, MEA. Dr. Raghavan, director general, Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, Dr. Shilesh Naik, former secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences. Uh, Excellencies, ambassadors from different countries. Ambassador of Iceland in India. Uh, Indian ambassador in Iceland, uh, Dr. Rasik Rivindra, Professor Chaturvedi, Dr. Rajan, uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
very good morning to you all it is my privilege to speak here about the india's engagement and particularly engagement of ministry of arts sciences in the arctic as uh, said by uh, mr reddy india's engagement with the arctic uh, dates back to a century when it signed the solvar treaty in february 1920 The Arctic region is of special importance due to its critical role in governing global climate, sea level, and biodiversity. Scientific issues pertaining to the Arctic has significance much beyond the its geographic limits. The Arctic region could also be called a driver of the tropical climate. Several studies have shown the connection between the Arctic region and the intensity of monsoon in India. bearing a direct impact on the indian agriculture sector and therefore the economy of india moreover the arctic indian ocean teleconnections will be an important aspect for research considering its impact on warming of the indian ocean sea level rise and marine ecosystem climate change is felt first and fastest in the arctic because of the amplified response of the arctic to global warming it is often often seen as a high sensitive indicator of climate change the polar scientific research remains a national priority for india a dedicated national center for polar and ocean research was established under the ministry of earth sciences in 1998 to lead the overall national effort in this regard india started its polar expeditions in 1981 when first expedition to antarctica was launched india has now two active research stations namely maitri and bharti in antarctica india also have the consultative status in the antarctic treaty system uh, india launched its first uh, scientific expedition to arctic in 2007 uh, we opened our first permanent uh, research station in madri in swalwad area in norway uh, focusing on research on biological glaciological and atmospheric sciences the station is now manned from march to november for about 180 days per year and over the years about 25 research institutes and universities has been engaged in the different areas the thrust area of research has been Uh, atmosphere science with special emphasis on the study of aerosol and precipitation cryosphere studies on the mass balance of glaciers and ca- chemical characterization of snow and physical and biological studies in the kong kong fort uh, india's major scientific ac- accomplishment in the arctic include the deployment of in dark india's first subsurface moved observatory in the polar waters which is deployed roughly half way between norway and the north pole and also commissioning of india's atmospheric observatory in the arctic region this observatory moved observatory has an array of state of the art oceanographic sensors strategically positioned at discrete depths in water column these sensors are programmed to collect real time data on sea water temperature <coughs> salinity current and other vital parameters of that area the indark observatory is an attempt to collect continuous data even during the extreme uh, uh, arctic winters the five year data from indark provided a good handle to our understanding of the arctic processes and their influence on the indian monsoon system through climate modeling studies uh, we anticipate that both these facilities would provide significant leap in terms of understanding the arctic climate and its possible link to the tropical processes the challenges in the arctic are common concerns shared by international community the impact of rapid changes in the arctic region goes beyond the states and the any legitimate and credible mechanism to respond to these challenges calls for active participation of all we need to take the challenges together search and observations are essential for predicting the evaluation of changes in the arctic and their impacts on regional <coughs> and to global scales the arctic is a complex system and it remains a challenge to monitor it 
even more so due to its vastness, low population density and extreme conditions. Costly research infrastructures are usually required to preserve the processes in the Arctic. Costs can be reduced by sharing research infrastructure and observing system, but also by making data freely and openly available in a timely manner. Cooperation among countries, research institutions and communities is therefore mutually beneficial for the partnering entities. Uh, minimizing the negative effects and maximizing the opportunities of the Arctic can benefit all. For achieving this goal, we should understand how the Arctic environment has been changing and what impacts these changes have on human communities and economies. The interplay between science and policy has to be potential to contribute to the better un understanding, better handling of the complex issues facing the Arctic. India, which has a significant expertise in this area from its association with the Antarctic Treaty System, can play a constructive role in securing a stable Arctic. India, in its role as an observer in the Arctic Council, is committed to contribute to the deliberations of the Council to develop effective cooperative partnerships that can contribute to a safe, stable and secure Arctic. Uh, Excellencies, India is closely following the developments in the Arctic region in the light of new opportunities and challenges emerging from the international community due to global warming and used melting of Arctic ice caps. India is committed to long-term monitoring of Arctic climate and looks forward to establishing additional stations observatories in the Arctic region to address the growing demands of global scientific community. A uh, National Center for Polar and Ocean Search under Ministry of Earth Sciences has very useful and important cooperation with various shoots in Norway, Japan, Sweden, Canada, Russia and we are also looking, exploring the cooperation with Denmark. Recently we have signed a memorandum of understanding with Canada, Polar Knowledge to set up some instruments in their, uh, their center known as Canadian High Altitude Research Station. Uh, MOES and the European Commission have established a co-funding mechanism to support the successful Indian participants in the projects between a European and Indian partners for certain India-EU collaborative, collaborative research and in innovation actions related to climate change and polar research. In the coming years, India looks forward to broaden its scientific initiatives in the Arctic with a pan-Arctic perspective. India understands the pressing needs of the global scientific community with respect to developing state-of-the-art research bases, allied infrastructure and data sharing. India is also committed to work toward the priorities of the International Arctic Science Committees and Arctic Council. We are over the years participating in the Arctic uh, Circle Assembly meetings also. I have the privilege to attend two of the Arctic Circle meetings in the 2017 and 2018. And uh, during these two years we have organized side events also, giving the perspective of India, what India is doing in the polar region. Similarly, in the last year also we have organized one side event during the Arctic Circle. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank the organizers, Indian Council of World Affairs for organizing this important event and giving the opportunity to me to speak uh, on behalf of Ministry of Earth Sciences. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now may I request His Excellency Mr. Olafur Ragnar Grimson to kindly give the 33rd Sapru House Lecture. Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me first 
thank the Indian Council of World Affairs for inviting me uh, and also <coughs> the CEO of the Arctic Circle, Dr. Finnis to attend uh, this forum and uh, for me to deliver the Sabra House uh, lecture <coughs> here today. It is a long time uh, since I first arrived in India. I was privileged to meet the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1983 <coughs> and to develop a cooperation uh, with uh, her successor Rajiv Gandhi as well as five other uh, leaders, Olaf Palme, Andreas Papandreou, Julius Nyerere and others on what was then called uh, the Six Nations Peace Initiative. It was at the height of the Cold War where the tension between the Soviet Union and the United States, the Eastern and the Western Bloc, dominated every continent in the world. And for me, this was a beginning of a long-standing friendship with India, a learning experience that has benefited me in multiple ways, made me a better human being, enriched my knowledge and vision of democracy, culture, economic advancement and also how the rise of Asia will dominate <coughs> the 21st century. So in that extent I own a great debt of gratitude to India. Very few countries apart from my own have given me so much over such a long time. And as I said in a recent letter to your Prime Minister, I have been privileged to work with five of his, uh, five of his predecessors over a number of uh, decades. And yesterday and the day before yesterday, I was able to have meetings with your Foreign Minister, your Minister of Climate and your Minister of Science and Technology on behalf of the Prime Minister to discuss uh, the enhancement of India's involvement in the Arctic and how also the lessons and the model of Arctic cooperation could benefit the growing need for the Himalayan countries to come together in a similar platform to examine what's happening to the glaciers in your immediate, immediate neighborhood. Many people <coughs> might wonder why should India be interested in this faraway place, the Arctic? Why should the government of India, the business community, the environmentalists, the scientists, concern themselves to what's happening in the ice-covered neighborhood of Greenland, Iceland, and the frozen tundra in Russia, Alaska, and other parts surrounding this top of the world? And the answer is actually very clear, that the future of India will be to a large extent determined by the Arctic. And the future of the Arctic will also be determined what happened in India and other Asian countries. Our common fate in this new century is so interlinked that it is impossible to discuss one or the other <coughs> without a deep understanding and engagement in uh, our part of the world. Of course, the Arctic is to some extent a, <coughs> a misnomer because we often talk about it <coughs> as if it is a region like Lapland or or Scotland or uh, other such uh, rather smaller geographical entities. We are in fact talking about a big part of the globe of continental proportions in terms of size. Alaska alone is three times the size of Texas. Greenland is equal to half of Western Europe. The Russian Arctic covers seven time zones. It's more than twice the continental United States. It's difficult 
giving our traditional way of how we talk about the Arctic to realize now in the beginning of the 21st century that in fact <clears throat> this is a huge part of the planet when we add it all up together. And of course, for centuries, it was completely unknown to the enlightened, educated part of the world, whether they were the educated people in Asia, Europe, the United States, or elsewhere. Of course, the indigenous people had lived there for centuries, even millennia. Some people say they might be descendant of the Indi Indian people in previous centuries or thousands of years. That's why when the first Norwegian English, Canadian explorers went into the Arctic in the beginning of the 20th century. They became world famous because they were really the first people to uh, enter this territory and then report back to the enlightened world what it was like. Although nobody knew whether they were alive or dead for three or four years until they suddenly turned up uh, returning. And then the Cold War closed this part of the planet up because of the intensive militarization and uh, conflict and strategic hostility between the Western and the Eastern Bloc. So paradoxically, dear friends, it's only in the last 20 years that this huge part of the planet has opened up for diplomatic, political, economic, and scientific, and cultural cooperation. There is no other part of the planet inhabited by states and communities and people and cultures that has so recently opened up for extensive multidimensional international cooperation. And the pace of that change has been so rapid, especially in the last five or ten years, that it has been a challenge even for the most informed of us to understand and draw conclusions from what is happening. It's only seven years since the Arctic Council accepted India, China, Korea, Japan and Singapore as observer states in the Arctic Council, the intergovernmental body established just 20 years ago by the United States, Russia, Canada and the five of us in the Nordic countries. If anybody would have said at the meeting in Corona where John Kerry represented the United States and Carl Bildt was in the chair on behalf of Sweden, that before the decade was over, China, Korea, Japan, would become so active participants in the Arctic cooperation that now we are witnessing for the last three years that these three Asian countries, Japan, Korea, and China, have regular trilateral consultations among themselves at the foreign ministry level to coordinate their Arctic policy. And they are built up in terms of economic involvement scientific involvement, diplomatic engagement is now so extensive that I have stopped calling them observer states. I call them action states in the Arctic. But India, my dear friends, being a great friend of this country, somehow in this Asian family of Arctic observer states is still at the railway station, which most of us thought would be the Arctic station five or ten years ago, while the rest of the Asian countries, as well as the European countries, France, Germany and others, have uh, scaled up their presence. I often think that this map is perhaps more informative about the Arctic playing field that we are now witnessing than the previous more well-known geographical picture of the Arctic. 
because here we have not only the Arctic states, the eight territorial states of the Arctic, but also the observer states that have been formally recognized as having a role at the Arctic table, including the Asian states and not just France and Germany, but also Italy, Switzerland, and uh, other countries in, uh, in the world. And one could ask oneself, as is often done, why is it, why is it that this constellation of leading G20 countries, United States, Russia, China, Korea, Japan, Canada, France, Germany, Britain, are all now in one way or another Arctic players. The reasons are of course multiple, but we have here also on the map listed few of them. The Arctic is of course extraordinarily rich in energy resources. That is one of the reasons why over 20% of Russian export earnings now come from the Russian Arctic. And it is yet another reflection of the geopolitical transformation taking place that the Russian government was recently reconstructed to have a ministry not just of the Arctic, but a combined ministry of the Far East and the Arctic. With gas pipelines not just from uh, Russia to Europe, but recently, as I will mention uh, soon, inaugurated 8,500 kilometers pipeline from the Russian Arctic all the way down to Shanghai in China. But it's also very rich in other clean energy renewable resources like hydropower, wind power and others. That's one of the reasons why my own country, Greenland, Scotland, Norway, Denmark, are leading renewable energy powers uh, in the world. But the Arctic is also, not just Russia, but Greenland, Canada and other parts, extraordinarily rich in mi minerals, mining, rare metals elements that are absolutely essential, especially for the high-tech IT industry in the 21st century. It is impossible to maintain a global leadership in the IT sector in the 21st century for India, China, United States or others without, in one way or another, having access to the rare metals and minerals in the Arctic. One of the reasons why President Trump tweeted about buying Greenland that the government of the United States has realized that Greenland harbors so rich resources that not just for strategic reasons but also for the American economy in the 21st century it would be an ideal partner. So those who thought the president was simply joking with his tweet must realize that it reflected a realization of the strategic economic importance of Greenland for the future of the American economy. But also the Arctic is extraordinarily rich in ocean resources. It is actually one of the major still non-polluted territories where large fishing fleets can still harbor Cutsets that can be important due to the melting of the ice. George Schultz, the former Secretary of State in America, one of the great elder statesmen of the United States, said a few years ago, imagine you got the New York Times tomorrow morning and the main headline was there is a new ocean on the planet. And by that he wanted to draw attention to the fact that the melting of the ice in the Arctic Ocean is for the first time in human history opening up a new ocean on the planet. And that is an ocean which could become a territory for new sea lines and shipping, not through the Suez Canal or the Strait of Hormuz, 
not through the territories that have made Singapore a great hub, but through the northern sea routes. Either the northeastern sea route along the Russian coast, and by the way, Russia has already a legislative framework to govern the shipping, or even across the pole through the so-called center route, in which China is especially interesting. The largest shipping company of China, Costco, having now for more than five years, had a systematic Arctic shipping strategy. And Korea is already building enhanced uh, tankers that can uh, sail the northern sea route transporting LNG without uh, having to add icebreakers to accompany them. Due to the opening of the Arctic Ocean. We are increasingly seeing attention being given by major shipping companies in the world to this new possibility of moving cargo from Asia to Europe and America. And it takes 10 days shorter than going through the old Suez Canal route. You only have to remember the wars over the Suez Canal and the strategic importance of it for the British Empire. And India, of course, doesn't need any lessons about the British Empire to realize the consequences of new zeros opening up in the planet. But perhaps what we are seeing now as the most dominant economic consequence of the opening up of the Arctic is the energy sector. As I mentioned before, a few months ago, President Putin and President Xi Jinping jointly celebrated the opening up of this huge pipeline, 8,500 kilometers from the difficult, challenging Arctic territory in Siberia and Russia, all the way down to Shanghai. And as President Xi Jinping said, it was a testimony to the engineering and the building skills of these two nations that they were able to construct this pipeline in the difficult territories and weather conditions, especially in the Russian Arctic. And I have said to my American friends in, uh, recently, just draw a line on the map of the US signifying 8,500 kilometers pipeline to realize the scale of this project. And when southern China has become dependent on the Russian Arctic for its energy, when Shanghai has plans its future on having access to the energy in the frozen Russian Tantra, we must all acknowledge that something has happened to fundamentally change how we look at geopolitics and energy in the 21st century. The power of Siberia is, of course, uh, perhaps a guiding concept for this. It's why the Russian government has made the Russian Arctic a key territory, why President Putin is organizing every second year a major conference in St. Petersburg all the key Russian ministers uh, attend on the big Russian companies because one cannot imagine the future of Russia without the utilization of the energy and the mineral resources in the Arctic. But it's not just with relations to China. It is also many of the other neighboring countries, including India. And as you are very familiar with, President Putin offered Prime Minister Modi the possibility of building a similar pipeline from the Russian Arctic to India. And as you know, there already is Nord Stream 2 and uh, such pipelines to Europe. And at the Munchen Security Conference over a year ago, the Vice President of the United States, the head of the National Security Council, uh, leading senators and others tried to convince the Germans and the Europeans that they should not continue with the energy trade with Russia, but that didn't have really any effect. So clearly continental Europe 
has also, like Shanghai and China, packed its energy future on the uh, stream coming from Russia, continuing throughout the 21st century. And one of the big questions for India is will it accept the offer, which I believe has been repeated by President Putin, to bring India also into this triangle of China, Europe, and then India and Russia in the future construction of the new energy system in the 21st century. So here we have shipping between Asia, Europe, and America, a new energy construction, and we only have to look at the importance of oil in the 20th, 20th century to begin to understand the geopolitical consequences of these new energy structures that I have just uh, described. And my guess is that uh, sooner or later the Modi government will accept this offer and start exploring systematically how to link India with this new construction. And then of course uh, the consequence of the Arctic for India will be obvious to everybody. But as has been mentioned here before, this is not just about shipping and energy and minerals and rare metals or ocean resources. It's also about the weather patterns and the climate. It's also about the monsoons and how what's happening to the ice in the Arctic has fundamental consequences for the weather patterns and the sea level in China India and other parts of Asia as well as every other continent in the world. The melting of the Greenland ice sheet is such and the consequence is so dramatic for every country in the world that if only a quarter of the Greenland ice sheet melts and it is melting very fast, sea level worldwide will rise two meters. And just look at the Indian coastal cities and start thinking about what will happen to Mumbai or other coastal cities in India with two meters rise in sea levels. The Chinese have already recognized this relationship between the southern cities in China and uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. But also the aggressive melting of the sea ice in the Arctic has enormous consequences for the weather patterns in Asia having in recent years provided, uh, unfortunately, extraordinary destruction. So, one cannot really understand <coughs> the weather patterns in your country and the neighboring Asian countries or even other parts of the world, like the strong winter in the United States that uh, created enormous damages and difficulties in the U.S. in the last few years without bringing into the picture what's happening to the ice in the Arctic and my part of the world. This picture of the uh, polar vortex and the implications of its changes for the weather patterns and climate in the Americas, in Asia and elsewhere is of course now a fundamental part of the acknowledged scientific wisdom. Perhaps not recognized 20 years ago, and let us remember it was only in the 1970s that scientists recognized the conveyor belts of ocean currents around the globe. So our understanding, or the understanding of the global scientific community of the interrelationship about what happens to the polar vortex and the weather patterns and the climate in every major continent in the world is in fact quite recent. So it is understandable that it takes time for others or the public in general to understand this relationship. But in this context, the relevance of the Arctic is also important for what is happening in your ice-covered neighborhood. There are only three major areas on the planet that are ice-covered. Antarctica, which we all know doesn't have states or people, Let's also remember, and I sometimes point this out, my father was eight years old when the first human being went to Antarctica. That is how recent 
that ice-covered continent became a part of the human experience. But the other two are the Arctic and the Himalayas, which increasingly has become to be called the Third Pole. In the Arctic, Russia, United States, Canada, and the Arctic Nordic countries have already established a systematic framework of cooperation. Not only the Arctic Council, but multiple other entities like the Arctic Circle. And we have recognized India, China, and the others as observer states. But the fact of the matter is, dear friend, there is not even a table in the Himalaya region. So the relationship between you, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, on what's happening in this neighborhood is almost zero. China and Bhutan do, do not even have diplomatic relations. And when we organized a conference in Dehradun some years ago in cooperation between me and the then Prime Minister of India, the Indian authorities didn't want to allow some of the key Chinese scientists to enter. And I'm not criticizing China or India, I'm just pointing this out as an evidence of the diplomatic realities. And although there are about 10,000 glaciers on the Indian side of the Himalayas, I doubt if the fully trained glaciologists in India uh, are in number so many that we could have one per 1,000 of glaciers in the, on the Indian side, whereas the Chinese have now, for a long time, had one of the most formidable glaciology institutes in the world. But this region is the origin, as you all know, of the great rivers of Asia. It is impossible to analyze the water future of India and China and other countries without looking at what's happening in this ice-covered neighborhood. Already we have reports of water scarcity in Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and elsewhere. And it's absolutely clear from my discussion with the Chinese authorities, they are scared, fundamentally, about the consequences for China of the melting of the glaciers in the Himalayas. But the Arctic model offers you many guidelines and insights and examples of how even countries like Russia and the United States, despite the conflicts over Ukraine and Syria and the Middle East and the sanctions, have been able to maintain reasonably good and constructive cooperation on the Arctic. And that is why we have also, in our meetings here in Delhi, not only talked about the Arctic, but also how what we call the Arctic model of cooperation, of science and understanding can help the Himalayan countries like India and China and others to come together. Like, because it is interesting, the Arctic has two very powerful countries, Russia and the United States. Then you have the five relatively small Nordic countries. The Himalayas have two powerful states, India and China. And then Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and others. So also in that sense, how smaller countries can cooperate within the framework of powerful leaders, the Arctic model is of great interest. Pictures like this, reports like this on television, of what's happening to the people in Asia because of the extreme weather patterns and the floods will become increasingly frequent in the years to come. And one of the reasons why we established the Arctic Circle in the same year as when India became accepted as observer state in the Arctic Council was my conviction that we needed a, <clears throat> a new international platform where governmental leaders, prime ministers, president, ministers, uh, leading scientists, uh, business leaders, environmental leaders, uh, indigenous people and others could come together in, as I said seven years ago, a kind of a Davos-like conference. And the interesting story is that <clears throat> we succeeded in making the Arctic Circle such a gathering. So every year now, 
We have in Iceland in October <coughs> over 2,000 people from more than 70 countries, including all the major countries of Asia and Europe in addition to Russia and the United States. Over 2,000 participants from, as I say, 60 to 70 countries with last year 700 speakers in 180 sessions. And it has become a fascinating 21st century platform of cooperation because it's organized in a different way from many other international conferences. It means that individual partners, whether they are governments or think tanks or institutions like the World Council here or business uh, companies or environmental organizations, whoever can organize sessions in their own name and have full authority over the session in terms of speakers and content. It is the democratization of the international dialogue where in most other cases everything is centralized and everything has to be in the name of that institution and where governmental representatives have a greater priority than the young activists. We give the young activists the same platform as a president of a country. And it has worked dramatically well. And in addition, we have organized in recent years forums in other countries. They are smaller in scale, three to seven hundred people specialized, but so far they have been in the United States, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Singapore, in Greenland, on the Faroe Islands, in Korea, and in China. And the next one will be in Berlin at the end of June then in Greenland, then in Tokyo before the end of the year, and follow that in Abu Dhabi uh, and Paris. So it has become a working, dynamic, evolving international platform of cooperation, and that is why part of my message here in Delhi today is to encourage the government of India, the various institutions in India, and other engaged in this and interested in this future to actively participate in the Arctic Circle assemblies and forum. Well, we have here on the picture some of the recent speakers, the Crown Princess of Sweden, but also Ban Ki-moon, who came to report to the Arctic Circle Assembly about the success of the Paris Climate Agreement, in which John Kerry, whom we gave the Arctic Circle Prize last October, was also directly involved. And this picture gives you also a sense of the crowd and the attention and the engagement of these various people. The President of France, President Hollande, came in October of 2015 and <coughs> made the keynote speech at the Arctic Circle. It was the only speech he made prior to the Paris Climate uh, Conference two months later. But I kept my promise to him in Paris some months before to take him before he spoke to one of our fastest retreating glaciers. But I decided to let the helicopter land not where the edge of the glacier is now, but where it was when I was born. And I let the president and his entire entourage and the French media walk for a long time across the black sands and the rocks and the wet territory until they finally came to the edge of the glacier where it is now. And as Christina Figueres said, before he went on that glacial walk with you, his political mind was of course engaged in the climate negotiations. But after he came back, his heart and his soul was also in it. Because, my friends, it is a formidable experience to witness the glaciers disappearing. And that's why I thought it was a striking message when your Prime Minister, a few days before the last election, went to the Himalayas and sat there meditating about the future of India and the future of the world at the edge of one of your Himalaya glaciers. And I'm not taking sides in Indian politics, I just found it interesting that that was the final image he wanted to send to the Indian people before they went to the voting places to choose the next uh, uh, government. So the Arctic Circle has, in its relatively few years, become a platform 
where major leaders and countries find it proper to present their case. Two years ago, the for then Foreign Minister of Japan traveled all the way to Reykjavik to present in a keynote speech the, the case of Japan in the Arctic. And I have invited similarly on my visit now high-level ministers from the Indian government to attend the next Arctic Circle Assembly and make a similar keynote presentation of the Indian policy and the Indian vision and the Indian project for the Arctic as the President of France and the Foreign Minister of Japan, to name a few, have done in recent years. This is the young governor of Yamanemets in Russia in his 30s. In our dialogue after his speech, I asked him, how come such a young man is a governor of such an important region in Russia? Yamal Nemec is one of the key energy territories in the 21st century. The estimation is that before the end of this decade, they will produce 20% of the LNG in the world. That means that this governor has a territory of Qatar-like importance for the global energy system. For those who don't understand how the Russian tundra is being transformed into an energy powerhouse for Asia, Europe, and potentially India, need to pay a visit to his region and see for themselves what is happening in Yaman Emirates. I was privileged to go to Sapeta a few years ago, where Less than 10 years before, there was nothing, literally nothing, except the frozen tundra. No human being, no habitation, nothing. Now there's a monumental energy production <coughs> and a new harbor where Korean tankers built recently by South Korea with icebreaker potential are transporting the Russian LNG to both Asia and, uh, and Europe. I sometimes, jokingly with my American audiences, ask them, how many of you have heard of Sapeta? Uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot here today. But usually there may be one or two in an audience of hundreds. Most of the Western Asian world have <coughs> not heard <coughs> about Sapeta. But it is one of the most significant energy locations in the 21st century. And this young man in his 30s was chosen by President Putin to lead that transformation in the coming years. And here you have a reminder of how the Arctic Circle has not only brought the assemblies annually to Reykjavik, but also this discussion on the Arctic and the future of the Arctic for the future of the globe and the future of the global economy and the cooperation in science and diplomacy to China, to Singapore, to Alaska, to Korea, to Washington, the Faroe Islands, Scotland, to Quebec <coughs> and Greenland, and in the coming months to Berlin, to Greenland, to Japan, and to Abu Dhabi, where I signed an agreement with the government of the United Arab Emirates recently to have the first major intergovernmental international <coughs> conference outside of Asia on the Himalaya Third Pole region. And with this presentation here today, I invite all of you to participate in this endeavor. And I can assure you, it not only will be intellectually fascinating, but it will also open your eyes that through the Arctic and potentially through the Himalayas, we are seeing one of the most fascinating geopolitical transformation of our times. So if we really want to understand the future of India and your place in the world, you have at least partly to relate that understanding to both the Arctic and the Himalayas. We have also, <coughs> this is the signing of this agreement, put on the screen this video for you, if we can play it now, which gives you a visual image of, uh, uh, okay, if you can start the video and put the sound down, please.
That is, my friend, a formal way of inviting all of you to join this uh, international, dynamic, democratic, and open cooperation, where each and every one of you can have a role that you seem fitting for your purpose. And I sometimes say it doesn't matter how clever I and my colleagues are in organizational efforts. We would not have been able to create this global platform of this scale and this dimension and this dynamic growth if there was not an underground wave of transformation moving around the world, bringing all these people together in the realization that on the one hand the Arctic and the other the Himalaya Third Pole are now absolutely critical for the future of our countries and the future of our planet. And later today, my good friend, the CEO of the Arctic Circle, Dr. Nesepeson, will give a more extensive presentation of how this relates to the Himalayan Third Pole effort. But for me personally, having learned so much from India over the decades of my active political life, it would be a great pleasure and privilege to see an enhanced Indian engagement from multiple sectors of Indian society, uh, governmental, business and scientific community in this Arctic endeavors and this fascinating new global journey that I have tried to describe to you in my lecture here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your insightful talk. Now the uh, Well, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Your Excellency, for what I can only describe as a brilliant lecture. And uh, really, it fulfills all the expectations we have from a Sapru House lecture uh, in, in, in brief, because it widens the parameters of the debate uh, for all of us. Uh, uh, I will not try to summarize it, uh, but uh, the three important takeaways, uh, uh, for me at least, were firstly uh, underscoring the importance uh, uh, of the Arctic uh, in economic terms, in geoeconomic terms, in geostrategic uh, uh, terms, uh, for all the reasons. And the most obvious reason being, of course, is this a new Suez uh, type situation? Uh, type scenario uh, emerging. But that's one important point. The second was, of course, the challenge of climate change. Uh, and you, you described it very graphically uh, in terms of a two meter rise in mean sea levels and the implications for this uh, uh, for uh, all of coastal Asia and all of monsoon Asia. Uh, it is a tremendous uh, uh, 
uh, challenge. Uh, and thirdly, and most importantly, and I think for uh, institutions such as this council uh, and other, uh, other bodies which think about, other institutions which think about uh, uh, regional issues and international issues, uh, about the Arctic model uh, for the Himalayan uh, fraternity. And uh, as I said, each of these three points widens the parameters of the debate. Uh, and I would like to both thank you and congratulate you for this wonderfully animated lecture uh, for uh, our benefit. Uh, I think we have some time for uh, questions. So with your permission, I would now uh, uh, open the floor for discussion. And I would request uh, uh, those of you with a question or a comment to be very brief and to first identify uh, yourself. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Balakrishnan, uh, Ambassador Balakrishnan, uh, also a distinguished uh, a scientist, and uh, he heads uh, many programs in one of our sister research institutions. Excellency, uh, in the Arctic Council, there are six observers who represent the indigenous people. Uh, how has their role been in the Arctic uh, Council? Maybe we could take three or four questions. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Can we have the microphone? Yeah, be there. Uh, good, good morning, sir. My name is Kanesh Gupta and I'm a strategic affairs blogger at Agrasar Bharat. Uh, my question is, sir, we already have a security concern in terms of uh, uh, retreating glaciers, glaciers and uh, melting ice in the Arctic region. So why are China, Russia and US building military installations over there? Because Russia had a major exercise called Vostok 18 last year and there are over 40 icebreakers and nuclear powered submarines and icebreakers also coming up in that area. We already have a security risk in terms of melting ice, so why the military installations there? Yes. yes. Uh, morning, Excellency. Uh, I had the pleasure, uh, privilege of uh, meeting you and Sabeta. You asked that question, Sabeta, in 2017, sir. Uh, my name is Anurag Bissain. I represent the National Security Council Secretariat. Uh, sir, my question is that the last Arctic Ministerial was the first time when, uh, you know, there was no joint declaration, sir. Uh, no, no joint declaration. Yeah. Uh, presumably on, on account of United States not agreeing for insertion of climate change in the declaration, sir. How do you see the spillover of this big power rivalry impacting the concerns of the smaller Arctic states in the Arctic Sea? Thank you. One more, yes, uh, Dr. Banerjee. Thank you, sir. I'm Dr. Stuti Banerjee. I'm a research fellow with the council. My question is, uh, so there is a lot of concern about China's rise and China's involvement in the Arctic. So. You have, as you said, I've said in my introduction, been an advocate of environmental concerns with respect to the Arctic. So there is a divide in the Arctic Council countries with some looking at environment as a primary cause, whereas others are going for sovereignty claims and militarization. So I want your comments on what you see as the future of these countries working towards both issues. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh for these uh, excellent questions and thank you for the compliment on my lecture. Uh, I know it's always a challenge uh, to talk about foreign policy in India because uh, you are one of the few countries that still maintain a very strict and tough intellectual tradition in talking about foreign affairs. It's much easier to get away with things in some other country. <laughs> So I, I thank you for your compliment because uh, I think the ultimate test for anybody talking about international issues is to come to India and subject oneself uh, to <laughs> criticism and comments from <laughs> the informed Indian audience. I always have admired your intellectual approach. I know it sometimes made things difficult for the decision makers in the Indian government, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> it is 
is one of the charming aspects of uh, the Indian uh, culture. The role of the indigenous people in the Arctic Council uh, is uh, of historical importance. I think the Arctic Council, the intergovernmental body of eight Arctic states, is the only <coughs> international organization which has recognized the inherent democratic right of the indigenous people to have a say in the future of the Arctic. Perhaps primarily on the basis that these people existed in the Arctic uh, for centuries or even thousands of years before these states existed. The Federation of Russia is relatively young, as we know, a few decades old. The United States is a few hundreds old. Canada is even younger. Uh, Iceland only became a republic in 1944, Norway uh, some decades before. So we have relatively young states wanting to tell uh, <coughs> the indigenous people what should be the future of their own territory. And to our credit, we have recognized the right of the indigenous people. And that's why many indigenous communities in other parts of the world are looking at the Arctic model as a basis for claiming more say in their own future. I never forget 10 years ago when I was in Bangladesh and was invited by the Minister of the Environment to take a sailing trip uh, to demonstrate uh, how rising sea levels would affect uh, the future of Bangladesh, as we all know. But it turned out uh, that the minister was also a king in his tribe of 4, 000, or 400,000 people. And as we sat there on the boat uh, discussing or witnessing how the sea level would rise in Bangladesh, he started a detailed discussion on the rights of the indigenous people in the Arctic Council, which he knew all about. And he said he was trying to claim the same right for his tribe, or whatever you want to call it, or his people, within the governmental system of Bangladesh. And I think this is one of the challenges for China, India, and other countries in the Himalaya region. To what extent are you going to empower the indigenous communities up in the Himalayas in the same way as we have done in the Arctic? And I never forget when I visited Yunnan in China, I went up to the mountains where four of the 12 glaciers had completely disappeared. And uh, the mayor of that community, a very strong woman, uh, started an extensive lecture in the presence of representatives of the Chinese Foreign Ministry who were accompanying me, complaining about the lack of understanding of the government in Beijing about what's happening to the water system in their region and, and their village. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the key questions for you in India, for the other Himalayan countries, as well as for us in the Arctic, is what will be the role of the people who have lived in these territories for hundreds and thousands of years and who will experience the dramatic consequences of change more than we do, who live in the capital of uh, these countries. The second question on the security concerns, yes, I know there is a lot, uh, I call it to some extent, media hype about the uh, security changes in the Arctic. But don't let us get too alarmist about it. Uh, I mentioned in my talk that uh, during the Cold War, this was one of the most militarized areas in the world. Uh, the Americans uh, abolished their base in Iceland. Uh, many of the bases in Greenland were closed. And of course, Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the uh, quality of the Russian military presence in the Arctic left a lot to be desired. I wasn't saying it was actually becoming rusty, but to some extent it was. So for a country like Russia to build up their capabilities for a territory which is covers seven time zones, seven time zones, and is of great economic importance for the future of Russia uh, is understandable. Uh, but I have said in the last year or so, we need to get in the Arctic 
an agreement about what is acceptable build-up of capabilities in, in the Arctic. Otherwise, every new step will be a base for scaremongering. Because it is understandable that important countries, whether they are United States up in Alaska or, or Russia in the Arctic, needs to have a certain capabilities. And uh, so far as China is concerned, I don't think there is any evidence yet of Chinese military interest in the Arctic. At least if anybody here knows of such evidence, I would like to hear it. So, so far China has explained the primarily a great economic interest in the Arctic, an energy interest in the Arctic, shipping interest in the Arctic, and of course a predominant scientific interest in the Arctic. But so far China has not entered the Arctic in any meaningful military sense. Neither has Japan or, or, or Korea. There, there are any military changes we see in the Arctic are on one hand Russia, the other other United States. And quite frankly, so far as the US concern is concerned, we still have to see Congress uh, providing the necessary funds for any meaningful military buildup in the Russian Arctic or, or even in Greenland where they clearly want to have an enhanced presence. And that's why, for the first time, the State Department is opening a consular office in Greenland. Iceland has so far been the only country with a diplomatic presence in Greenland. Now, the US State Department this this year opening an office in, uh, in Greenland. That doesn't mean that this will not change. But so far, I don't think we can say there is a military race or an alarmist military buildup uh, in the Arctic. So I don't think India needs yet to discuss its uh, presence in the Arctic from a military uh, point of view. But it might change, who knows? Uh, but so far uh, the evidence is not there. And you're absolutely correct, uh, the, the melting of the glaciers is a far greater threat in terms of economic security, population <coughs> security, uh, uh, even climate security than any military structure that has been built up uh, in the Arctic. And you, one of the reasons I took President Hollande to this glacier in Iceland is that until you are in front of the glacier, you don't understand the power, the force, of what's happening. Uh, we took him into the glacier almost and we left him there alone so he could listen to the glacier cracking. Because in fact the melting of the glaciers creates a sound. I sometimes call it the music of climate change. And it's a powerful experience to witness with your ears how climate change uh, is happening. And you realize it doesn't matter what military capability you have, the power of this force, whether it's in Greenland, in the Himalayas, or elsewhere, is so strong that there is nothing in the military capability of our countries, even the US or Russia, that can stop it. The only thing that can stop it is a comprehensive energy transformation everywhere uh, in the world. The reason why there was not a joint declaration at the Arctic Council Ministerial meeting last year was of course uh, the Trump government uh, does not want to sign any declaration that makes climate change uh, a key issue. But it's also very interesting that the Trump administration is the first American administration which takes an active interest in the Arctic in its first term. Obama, with all due respect, had no interest in the Arctic in his first term. Hillary was a lonely voice in his government about the importance of the Arctic. And she has described to me how almost every official in the State Department told her, don't bother, don't bother. The uh, Secretary of the U.S. should concern himself with other issues or herself. But she became the first Secretary of State to go to a ministerial meeting of the Arctic, uh, Arctic Council. But of course, the, Trump, the speech made by Pompeo was transformative. It is the first speech of its kind where geopolitical tensions has been brought into an Arctic ministerial meeting on the scale that he did. And he warned the rest of us against China, 
saying China is not a near Arctic state, basically saying China has no role in this rule. And no other Arctic state agreed to that. We had the Arctic Circle Forum in Shanghai the following days. And some of the key representatives of Sweden, Norway, Canada and other countries came straight from the ministerial meeting in Finland toward the Arctic <coughs> Circle Forum in, in Shanghai. And nobody agreed with this. And we are now seeing these very ones, the scientific cooperation called Mosaic, where 17 countries, including uh, China, Korea, Japan, uh, uh, Canada and others, for the first time in human history have a research expedition for 12 months period around the North Pole. We have never been able to collect data, scientific data, during the winter months in the North Pole area. This is of historic uh, importance, and it will be fascinating to see the scientific result. And the German representative uh, at the forum in Shanghai declared without China's participation it would not have been possible. So you have the other Arctic states saying we will not be able to conduct the necessary research in the Arctic without the involvement of the Asian countries. So the interesting question will be if Trump gets re-elected, how will they follow this up? In the US system, uh, the Alaska defense has been primarily the subject of the Coast Guard, not of Pentagon and the Defense Department. This is changing. Now Pentagon is taking an increasing interest. One of the reasons why the US is opening an office in Greenland is that they want to scale up their military presence in Greenland. So it is of course possible that in a second term, term we will see an escalation of this. If the Democrats win, I, I think it's a very open question what, what's going to happen. But I don't think it will bring in China in a military sense to the other. It will primarily be, on the one hand, measuring up with what the Russians are doing, but also, one has to admit it and be aware of it, that increasingly in the US, as you know from your dialogue with the US President and the new relationship between India and the United States, not only the Republicans, but also the Democratic leadership see the big game in the 21st century being between China and the US, rightly or wrongly. And what the Trump administration has done is to bring the Arctic into this framework of the big game in the 21st century. So as I have said to the Indian ministers yesterday, day before yesterday, sooner or later, maybe already, in your bilateral discussions with the United States, the U.S. will bring the Arctic onto that, that table and will ask you about how that reflects on your relationship with China, your relationship with Russia, your relationship with other Asian countries, and your relationship with the United States. If the Democrats win the election, it is, however, uh, a more, uh, more open question. Uh, I have already mentioned the Mosaic expedition. If one visits the polar institutes in Seoul in Korea and in Shanghai, it is hugely impressive. I have said to my friends in the Nordic countries, none of us, although we are formerly Arctic states, whether well, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, or Iceland, have anything comparable to what the Koreans and the Chinese have in terms of their polar institutes, the research vessels and their technology. Korea, two years ago, formally approved what they call Korea Polar Vision 2050. They have a 30 years plan on their engagement in the polar region. So I often, when people want to talk to me about China and the Arctic, move the conversation over to Korea and the Arctic. Because I think that is more interesting as a reflection that this is a much broader global transformation <coughs> taking place than just China, Russia and the United States. 
I first experienced this in the second last year of my presidency when I participated, no, it was even before, it was I think in, in 2012, when I visited uh, the World Economic Forum Conference in Davos. And I was asked to meet uh, some Korean members of parliament who were representing the, the, the then newly elected president of Korea. And I didn't know what they wanted to talk about. I found it quite strange. Why, why on earth did they want to meet with me? But it turned out they had been asked by the newly elected president of South Korea to ask me to support Korean membership for observer state in the Arctic Council. At the same time, the Prime Minister of Singapore was going to visit Washington for a meeting with President Obama. And as is the practice, there was a preparatory meeting of officials from Singapore and officials in Washington to prepare their meeting. So at the end of this preparatory meeting, the Singapore officials said to the White House officials, then of course the Prime Minister wants to talk to the President about the Arctic. And the Washington White House guys just laughed. They thought it was a joke. So when the meeting started, the first thing that the Prime Minister of Singapore brought up was to ask for support from President Obama for Singapore being an observer state in the Arctic Council. But the guys who had laughed in the White House had consequently not prepared the President or even told him this would be on the agenda. <laughs> so he was completely unprepared. And I'm telling you these two stories, one my own experience, the other is Obama experience, to illustrate to you how recently this transformation has taken place. And the scale of what has happened since these two meetings took place is one of the most fascinating evidence of high-speed geopolitical transformation taking place in front of our eyes. And India surely and clearly has to be on board that train in a massive way. Thank you. Do we have time for one more round? Uh, yeah. If you agree, sure, sure. Your Excellency. Sure. Yes. Sir. But there was there was also a question about balancing the uh, the, 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 the economic potential. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, the uh, the yeah, 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 from South Asian University. <coughs> um, I'm Sanjay Chaturvedi from South Asian University, New Delhi. Uh, it has been a great privilege uh, and great learning experience listening to you. My question relates to what um, the Arctic social scientists, polar social scientists are calling the Arctic paradox. Uh, given that we are looking at these transformations within the overarching context of what we call Anthropocene, uh, we often also wonder about the continuity in this change, in the changing Arctic. And the paradox relates to the fact that on the one hand we are looking at the role that fossil fuels have played in global warming. On the other hand, one of the catalysts for the so-called scramble in the Arctic also happens to be these U.S. Geological Survey maps and the potentials for oil that we are talking about in the Arctic. So my question is, looking ahead and looking at all the three poles, which is because the melting of the Antarctic could also lead to a very, very serious uh, consequences, I wonder whether on the menu of different narratives about the Arctic engagement, should we not be giving importance to ecological narrative, the Anthropocene narrative, mm. and the kind of dilemmas that this Arctic paradox creates, and what kind of diplomacy and science diplomacy would we need to address this Arctic paradox? Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, I'm Air Marshal Chaudhry from uh, the National Defense College. Uh, given the four key aspects of uh, energy, trade, uh, environment, and water security. And uh, in your perspective, sir, despite your trepidation to comment on anything on, to do with internet, India's international relations, where do you think the focus of India's Arctic interest should lie 
should and when the train finally starts moving from the station? Yes, the lady at the back. I'm Shalogna and we have a, a think tank on polar issue. We're working for a decade now called Saga. Um, my question is, uh, you know, you have uh, said, reiterated that China anxiety is not something that you should worry from. But uh, Iceland, uh, Finland and Sweden, um, they have this observatory which has come up 17, 18, uh, 16, 17, 18, uh, all of them commissioned, and one in Iceland as well, recently functioning, uh, which has, uh, uh, you know, people have been saying that maybe the NATO airspace is being monitored and uh, there are, you know, people who are writing about this. So, I mean, I would like to know what your views are on that. Uh, but uh, there are uh, observatories, uh, military observatories set up in Not military, space observatory, space observatory. Yeah. Uh, and are being, uh, uh, and there's a great yeah, deal yeah. of NATO activity. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You're talking about the observatory in Iceland? In Iceland, yeah, yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, one here. Thank you, Chair. I am Dr. Athar Zafar, Research Fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs. And thank you for the wonderful lecture. I think it will be remembered for a long time. Uh, my question is related to the uh, membership or observation at the council. So what are the uh, basic criteria? So the four, uh, Asia, four of the five Asian countries are leading economies also uh, of Asia. And what are the interests uh, you find in Central Asian countries? They are also quite vulnerable. And uh, you rightly refer to the Himalayan region being the third pole. And the Tian Shan uh, mountains, they have the largest number of glaciers uh, on land. So they are also uh, quite vulnerable. So have they shown any interest in uh, Arctic uh, Council? Thank you. Yes, 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 sir. Thank you very much for your very brilliant lecture. I have two small issues. One issue is that how the release of methane from permafrost is going to be addressed by the Arctic Council. The release of methane. Methane from permafrost. permafrost. Yeah, okay, yeah. And the second issue you showed uh, that what is likely to happen, like sea level rise and the floods in Asia and many other countries. Is there any way the economic loss which would have of this is going to be more or less compared to the economic gain which we'll have from the energy. Okay, last question there. Uh. Thank you, sir. I am Dr. Sanjeev, a researcher from ICWA. Uh, sir, it was a wonderful lecture and I greatly benefited. My question is about China. Uh, you very rightly said that in the current context, there is no military sense as far as Chinese actions are concerned. But here, I would like to bring the uh, white paper issued around two years ago uh, by China on Arctic policy. And it very clearly and directly talked about how to advance the Arctic cooperation. And it said that the, it, can, it, it should be, uh, it should be, advanced through Belt and, Road, Belt and Road Initiative, that is a controversial project as we all are aware. But more importantly, it said that we have to build a community of common destiny for the humankind. They, they directly link the Arctic policy with building community of common destiny for the humankind. It is a highly controversial political concept proposed by China. Uh, so, and you very rightly talked about the uh, geopolitical transformation in the region. So, through this document, they want to lead the geopolitical transformation, if you could comment. Thanks. And I have also a second question. Uh, there were the reports about, uh, you talked about Costco shipping uh, corporations uh, involved in Arctic, the Chinese company. There are reports about U.S. Uh, imposing sanctions on uh, Costco for uh, for uh, bringing crude Iran Iranian oil, whether it has affected, 
whether it has any impact on their working in Russian Arctic. Thank you. Sorry, could you explain the second question a little bit more? Uh, last year. U.S. sanctions on Costco yes, okay. because of transporting yeah, Iranian okay. oil. Yeah, yeah, Will this impact? Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Okay, well, I must say again, uh, I have talked about the Arctic in many countries. Uh, very rarely do I get such uh, uh, insightful questions as I have had here. As, uh, one more testament to what I said before. The ultimate challenge for anybody who wants to be taken seriously on international affairs is to come to India, <laughs> give a lecture and see what happens. <laughs> So I think all these questions are, are absolutely critical in terms of the debate and how we move forward. And I will try to respond to them very briefly. First, what I forgot of the previous set is this dichotomy between the environment and economic progress in the Arctic. We should not forget that there are four million people who live in the Arctic. And they want to be a part of the global economy. Uh, they want to have a prosperity uh, and livelihood and health service and interconnectivity uh, like any others. And it is perfectly reasonable to have uh, economic activity in many parts of the Arctic, which are absolutely no threat to the environment. I'm absolutely sure if you went to northern Norway, and you talk to the, uh, the mayors, the business leaders, the scientists, and the environmentalists, they would not uh, maintain that the economic progress in northern Norway is threatening the environment. On the contrary, they would uh, try to claim that uh, northern Norway is a good example of how you can uh, live in harmony with the environment as well as having Northern Norway, one of the most prosperous Nordic uh, areas uh, that we can encounter. Similarly in Greenland, you have a country half the size of Western Europe with 55,000 people. It's uh, very difficult to vis visualize economic development for Greenland that would uh, in a fundamental way threaten uh, the environment in Greenland. I think, in fact, what's happening in the energy economy in India, China, United States, and Europe is a greater threat to the environment in Greenland than uh, the economic activity in Greenland so far. But they have been very careful. For example, Alcoa has wanted to build an aluminum smelter in Greenland for a long time. But they've said no, because uh, that smelter would be such a fundamental uh, course of change in the social, cultural, economic structure of the society in Greenland, that they have turned them down. One of the reasons why Greenland is perhaps more interested in building hydro power stations and export the energy through, through cables to neighboring countries, because that would not have a similar effect. Of course, in Russia and Canada, and Alaska, it is a more crucial question that was raised because the mining in these three countries uh, surely also is to some extent uh, a threat or uh, an element in the environmental future, not only of these three countries but also of, of the entire planet. So we have examples both ways in the Arctic, both ways of communities having economic progress uh, and being able to sustain the environment in a responsible way. And we also have examples where uh, the story is uh, regrettably uh, otherwise. But I think in the last five or six years, the awareness of the uh, environmental dimension in uh, Arctic development has been recognized uh, by almost uh, uh, almost everybody. Uh, you asked about uh, the so-called Arctic paradox in terms of uh, what will happen to the ice and then the utilization of the oil and so on. And of course this is one of the interesting questions. It's, it's one of the reasons why Total, the French, energy oil company said they are not going to be involved 
uh, in Arctic drilling. It's one of the reasons why we have some global shipping companies saying we are not going to use the Northern Sea Route. So there is clearly a recognition that it's problematic to uh, continue uh, along the oil explorations in the Arctic. But one of the reasons why the Russians and the Chinese claim, I think rightly, that their new pipeline uh, from Siberia down to Shanghai is positive, is that it is natural gas replacing coal. So at least for some decades, I think the case can be made that by increasing the production and access to natural gas from the Russian Arctic, and if you, you start to close down coal power stations and other more dirtier fuel, there can be a positive contribution, although it's not a perfect solution. But we should not forget either that uh, the Arctic is also the home to vast renewable energy resources. Greenland is probably the last, the biggest reservoir of hydropower left in the Western world. And with the new technology in ocean cables, you can transport it to either Europe or to the United States. Norway, as you know, is already building cables to Netherlands, Germany, Britain to export hydropower to these countries in order to enable them to deal with peak demands in their energy systems. And one of the reasons why, why Microsoft decided to put its data storage center in Denmark was the combination of wind power from Denmark and hydropower from Rory through cable that could enable Microsoft to run that largest data center in Europe for Microsoft entirely 100% on, on clean energy. And the wind patterns in the Arctic including on my own country, are such that using and building wind power stations is more economical. They don't have to be as high. They have a greater productivity. That's why the Faroe Islands, that will soon become 100% clean energy because of the success of their, of their wind power. So it is a complicated picture. And it is misleading to think, as sometimes is presented, that the Arctic energy question is simply about oil drilling. Uh, it is, uh, that's, that's why Sabeta is interesting. That's why the LNG export from Yaman Emmets is interesting. That's why this pipeline is interesting. That's why the offer by Putin to Prime Minister Modi uh, is interesting. And also why Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Faroe Islands could become a clean energy powerhouse for Europe through a new network of ocean, ocean cables. So I often say the Arctic is also a big part of the renewable energy future and the responsible transition from coal over to natural gas over to renewable energy in the, uh, in the coming years. What should be India's priorities in terms of Arctic interests? Well, first of all, I would say to meaningfully live up to your status as an observer country in the Arctic Council. That means giving priority, a new level of priority to Arctic policy making, not just in terms of science, but in terms of diplomacy, energy, economic activity, and, and other areas. <laughs> You already have a seat at the table. I know it's a limited seat, but it's a seat you share with France, Germany, United Kingdom, China, Japan, Korea, uh, and, and other countries. And since you were accepted, the role of observer state has evolved in a more enhanced way. But of course, since the energy offer from Russia is on the table, the most immediate question is, does India want to be a part of the Arctic energy future? That is a question which has already been brought to your Prime Minister, and you can already examine the case of Europe and the case of China in order to enable you to answer that, answer that question. 
I would say the third priority is to examine looking at what other ASEAN countries are doing. What would be the role of Asia vis no role of India vis-a-vis -vis the other Asian countries with respect to the Arctic? Because in fact, what China, Japan, and Korea are doing is uh, bigger, more extensive, more active than any of us expected. And as somebody mentioned, the new China Arctic policy is a good evidence of that. It's probably the most sophisticated Arctic policy put forward by any country uh, in recent years. I must admit, I don't know if India has a similar document, but it might be an interesting exercise for India to go through that exercise, giving your intellectual knowledge-based tradition of foreign policy making. But then you also need to look at the resources and the, your economic presence in the Arctic. There is a, a Malaysian diplomat, no, a, Ma a Malaysian businessman, uh, Vincent Tan which bought the largest hotel chain in Iceland last year. He has now put on the table a plan for a new hotel in the capital of Greenland. He wants to build a hotel chain across the Arctic because he wants to get a part of the profit of the growing Asian tourism uh, to the Arctic. Uh, I mentioned before access uh, to mining uh, in not only Greenland uh, but other parts. You have to make, and your big companies have to make a strategic decision, where are you going to secure your access to rare metals and minerals in, in the 21st century? Are you going to do it completely outside the Arctic? Or are some territories in the Arctic going to be part of your resource plan? Uh, and that's a very serious question. Uh, that's one of the reasons why gold mining in Greenland uh, it will probably be very prosperous, because all of the big IT companies in the world require gold for their production. And they're getting a bit tired of having to deal with unstable African countries as a provider of these resources. And then, of course, comes the evolution of global shipping. Of course, geographically, India is differently placed than China, Korea, and Japan in that respect. Uh, I listened to an Indian representative at the Arctic, one of the Arctic Circle Assemblies a few years ago, where he presented a very interesting notion of uh, planning sea routes from India and Asia up to the uh, Arab Gulf, and then putting the cargo <laughs> on land uh, in the Iran and transporting them on trains through Iran up to Europe, uh, Russia, and then across the Atlantic to America. It was a fascinating vision. The only problem is the political position of Iran uh, in, in that plan. But I mention it here as an evidence that now major countries are looking at new transport lines. And whatever you think about the Belt and Road, or the so-called Polar Silk Road. If you are in the Chinese leadership and you face the prospect that you're going to be the major economy in the world in the 21st century, you want to have highly modern transport system. You want modern railways, you want modern harbors, you also want a modern IT communication. In the same way as the British and the Americans and the French wanted the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal for their economic development uh, in previous times, it is absolutely understandable that a major trading country like China wants to have a modern infrastructure for transport, uh, IT communication, railways, whether they are fast speed trains or whatever. We now have trains producing, uh, transporting cargo from China to, to the Netherlands, to the edge of Europe. And they started with, I think, two, two trips a week. They are now 25 times a week, which shows the level of increase of the level of uh, the amount of cargo. So India, in one way or another, also has to answer the question, what kind of modern infrastructure 
are you going to use in the 21st century for your economic interaction with Europe, Asia, uh, other parts of the world? And uh, whatever we say about the uh, political strategic uh, uh, nature of the uh, Belt and Road, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's an understandable proposal. The difficulty is that it is still so vague that it's difficult to actually conclude what it means. So when they added the Polar Silk Road to this notion in the policy document that you mentioned, the China Arctic policy, which you all should read because it's a fascinating evidence of their sophisticated thinking about the Arctic, all of us Ask the question, what does this mean to add the Polar Silk Road to the general Belt and Road notion? Which, because it didn't exist when President Xi Jinping first launched this. So what I'm simply saying is whether it is China, Russia or some of your neighbors are now in the process of planning out a new communication infrastructure between Asia and Europe and other parts of the world. And India has to make up its mind in what way you are going to be uh, a part of it. The role of the Arctic Council has, of course, evolved. But it is still limited in the sense to scientific environmental issues. Military issues are not on the table. Political issues are not on the table. Pompeo's speech was the exception of a geopolitical speeches by Arctic ministers, foreign ministers at the ministerial meeting. So that is why the Arctic Circle has fulfilled an important function. Because we can talk about all these aspects, whether they are strategy, economic, environmental, geopolitical, or whatever. And also because we have organized at the Arctic Circle assemblies what we call country sessions, it means that countries like France, Germany, United Kingdom, Singapore, Japan, Korea, Switzerland and others have come to the Arctic Circle Assembly and presented their case, their policies, their projects, their plans, and then accepted to be questioned by the participants on this. And I find it remarkable as an observer and practitioner of international issues that China, Korea, Russia, US and others have accepted to turn up formally at the Arctic Circle Assemblies and then take questions from anybody in the audience. And in that way we provide the function of accountability in this evolution because they all now know that every year in October they will be examined by this vast audience of over 2,000 people from probably the most active constituency on Arctic affairs. And that is what India needs to do also in order to maintain the reputation among the active Arctic community that you are a player, if I may uh, say so. You simply don't have a chair uh, among the observer states at the Arctic Council. You're also a player in the wider sense of the world. That was why it was interesting why Korea came to us and the Arctic Circle Secretariat some years ago and said, we want to give a party on the final night and we want to invite everybody to this party. We hadn't thought about that, but we said yes, because it was a fascinating way to, for them to signal we are part of your family. We want to have a song and dance and invite you to a, a party. And then Japan came and said, we also want to give a party next year. And then China came and so on. So well, maybe India would have a party <laughs> uh, to... Uh, it's a formal offer, I'm not joking. If the Indian foreign ministry and the other ambassadors, you're for the taking, uh, <coughs> want to organize an Indian night, bring some food, an Indian dancer and so on. It would, would be a very sophisticated way to India, even if you don't bring the foreign minister, to, to say, hey guys, we are here also. So take it seriously from me. Uh, you can organize a party at the Arctic Circle, either this year or next year. Uh, so part of the Arctic involvement is this, are these other platforms 
And the Arctic Circle is not the only one. This is the biggest, the most dynamic one, but there are others as well. So that is important to understand. It's not just a territory for intergovernmental activity. It's a territory where almost anybody who wants to be a participant can actually be a participant. Regarding permafrost, it is a very good point. It is one of the perhaps neglected areas in this cooperation, both in terms of scientific research. And we have often discussed it in the Arctic Circle Secretariat, how we could perhaps help to further an international scientific dialogue on, on the permafrost. Because in all this spectrum of climate change and the impact on the future of the planet, this is one of the neglected uh, areas. So you are absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. How the U.S. sanctions will affect all of this? Well, the interesting thing is, and if I was a leader of the United States, I would worry about this. The world, even Europe, Western Europe, increasingly is not listening to what you are saying. When the Chinese decided to establish the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, Obama opposed it very strongly. I think Australia, maybe a few other countries were the only countries that listened. I don't know about India, I haven't looked at that. No, oh, I think India is a partner. We are the biggest on the board here. Yeah, 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 absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely, yes. And my own country, France, Germany, Britain, and others. So now, Belt and Road, Trump is saying the same thing. Don't be a part of the Belt and Road. So let's remember, Trump is not the first one to say don't work with China. Obama was the first one. And most of us simply, you know, shrugged our shoulders and say, so what? And then Trump came along and said, uh, Belt and Road, don't work. The fact of the matter is, four or five or six NATO countries are already formally parts of the Belt and Road. Even Luxembourg is my favorite example. Formally joined Belt and Road uh, last year. <laughs> Luxembourg is a founding member of NATO, founding member of the European Union, key country in the financial structure of the European Union. I don't think France or Germany, or even the US, uh, tried in any significant way to prevent them from being a member of the Belt and Road. Italy, of course, is a member of the Belt and Road. Even the Norwegian representative at the Arctic Circle Assembly in Shanghai said, well, Norway will perhaps not formally be a member of the Belt and Road, but we will examine individual projects. But the Belt and Road simply consists of individual projects. So that was another way to say Norway will be a part uh, of this. So, I don't really know what effect American decisions on this, with all due respect to both Obama and President Trump, will have. When Vice President Pence came to Iceland last year, he had two messages. That is correct, he only had two messages. One was to warn us against China in the Arctic. And the other one was to warn us against uh, Huawei, uh, the 5G uh, telecommunication company. My response to that was the following. There are two countries that are actively, formally working with China on the Arctic. Korea and Japan. They happen to be your key allies in Asia. Have you said this to them? Of course they had not. Of course they had not. And the other one on the telecommunication company and the 5G was to point out that the telecommunication company in Iceland that is actively working with Huawei uh, on 5G happens to be owned by an American investment fund. So I said, you should talk about this back home to the owners of the telecommunication instead of coming all the way to Iceland to talk about it, because quite frankly, we, we, we don't own that company. It's owned by you guys, PT Capital uh, in Alaska. So what we witness is a lot of song and dance in the diplomatic community, but the reality is different. The reality is different. And quite frankly, I think the US has some tough thinking to do 
in order to make up its mind how they're going to be effective. But don't let us forget that although China and Russia are working now arm in arm on the energy and many of these issues, there is no long-term guarantee that they will continue to be partners. There is this famous story when Kosygin uh, went to Vietnam to attend the funeral of uh, Ho Chi Minh. And he stopped in Beijing on the way back for a meeting with Xu Enlai. And Kosygin, uh, of course, in a very polite diplomatic way, talked about the great partnership between Russia and China. And Xiu Enlai said, yes, but it will take at least a thousand years to bring out whether that is a solid partnership <laughs> or not. <laughs> Kosygin, of course, was taken aback by that statement. He said, no, 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 it's not going to take that long. And Xiu Enlai said, yeah, maybe, maybe it will take 900 years. <laughs> <laughs> so let us be aware that uh, there is no guarantee that the picture we have described here today is going to be permanent. What is clear, however, is for the first time in human history, we are witnessing the new geopolitical importance of the Arctic on the one hand and the Himalayan Third Pole region on the other. And it's up to all of us to construct the framework and the rules of engagement to make that cooperation successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you both for your brilliant lecture and also the patience with which you have addressed uh, uh, all these uh, questions. Uh, we could have gone on, but there is, we are going to talk about the Arctic for the rest of the day uh, and the seminar will follow and I am I do hope, uh, Your Excellency, you will no, be here some of the time, time yeah, no, sure. because I'm sure many of those present sure, here no. uh, would be very keen to engage further with uh, you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words and your insightful lecture. May I, on behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, request DGICWA to kindly give you a token of our appreciation. A small memento from our council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank you. Very kind. Some of our recent uh, books and our regular journal. Oh, thank you very book. much. There is uh, more on this in the Arctic in, yeah, the, uh, in the future. Yeah, more evidence about the Indian thinking about the world of yeah. you. So you will make sure I have something to do when I return back home. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for thank your you. patience. And your Ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking a very short tea break and then proceeding with the conference. Thank you. And Dr. David Molden, I would request the chair, Dr. Thailesh Nayak, to take over from now. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And uh, we will start the first session on the Arctic Scientific Frontiers. And we have uh, three very distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Krishnan, Dr. Hatha, and Dr. David Moy. Uh, before I request them, I will just say a few things. I think the most important thing which is in the Arctic is it has uh, provided entire global scientific community an opportunity to understand the how the snow and ice or the cryosphere is influencing the entire Earth system. And uh, it was very well said in the morning uh, by His Excellency Mr. Crimson that Arctic, Himalaya and Antarctic uh, forms the one of the largest uh, concentration of snow and ice. And whatever is happening there is going to affect the global weather and climate. And we need to see that how this understanding can be useful to the society. There are three uh, main aspects which I think we need to address. That whatever happens in the 
earth system or the weather and climate is essentially because of the exchange of mass and energy or both <coughs> among the different components or within single component. That means what happens between uh, cryosphere and atmosphere or ocean or biosphere or within cryosphere itself. Now in this uh, exchange, mass and exchange has certain implications on the earth system. The first is the sea ice, we know that it's been reducing and that is going to reduce the albedo and that means the less amount of energy will be sending back. So indirectly it again feedbacks into further warming. So once you lose the sea ice, the warming will become much faster and faster. The second is the melting of the land ice and it has uh, three major components. One when the melting starts, a lot of algae comes. Many of you might have seen that the red algae which is coming among the Antarctica. A similar thing happening in Arctic, in Himalaya, everywhere. This algae further reduces the albedo. That means the energy which is being absorbed more and more by the ice, which leads to the further melting. The second is the because of the land ice melt, it increases the sea level and the inundation can take place along uh, the coastal areas. But I must caution that it is not the average level rise of the level. And uh, initiate uh, larger scientific observations in the Arctic Ocean. The Aron was one of the examples which I told. But definitely we are looking out for options to engage ourselves in larger uh, scientific uh, oceanographic observation, the atmospheric observations, etc. So with this, uh, thank you for uh, hearing me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan, uh, for the articulating the efforts by India. May I now request uh, Dr. Mohammad Hatha uh, to speak on rapidly warning Arctic implications for life in fjords and tundra with special reference to microbial communities. Yes, yes, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chief Guest of the Day, His Excellency Mr. Grinson, and all other uh, dignitaries. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, ICWA for uh, giving me this platform to present some of our research. And uh, you know, we are there uh, with NCPR for the past 10 years. I'm very happy to see. Sikravindra sir was the first one when I went to Arctic in the 2009. So I'll just touch upon some of the issues which are in general and then what we exactly are doing. So we'll go to our... Go to the first slide, please. And this is... Yes, as we all know, like the Arctic is warming double the speed uh, than uh, Antarctic or uh, other uh, global oceans, you can see the temperature, even it might go up to 4 degree centigrade mean uh, annual warming when compared to uh, in the late boreal autumn, which is uh, pretty fast, which is of great concern. The way it is warming, the rate at which it is warming is of great concern. Go to the next slide. So this, and uh, you know, the sea ice loss, uh, there is two things. One is, of course, sea ice loss is there, which is affecting uh, the communities, especially like uh, large mammals, like polar bear. Uh, their hunting grounds are seriously affected. They are facing a real threat. Uh, they have to spend more energy because there is 
not sufficient sea ice to have a transient kind of a movement. They have to actively spin. Yeah, this is working. Yeah, so here, uh, their uh, serious concern that it is going to definitely affect the species assemblages and interactions in the Arctic. Then influx of uh, subarctic species will find its way with the current to the Arctic and the warmer environment will make it uh, more hospitable for them to stay there. But at the same time, the Arctic species will have some issues uh, with, you know, the lack of sea ice which they use it as a transporter for hunting grounds and all those things. Where you can see, as our chair has nicely explained, there are implications in the atmosphere, cryosphere, I'm not going into that. I will just simply touch upon this biosphere. This is based on the very recent paper which is published in uh, December 2019 in Science Advances. <laughs> where you can see the sea ice, sea ice decline, contributing loss of habitat, which is very clear, very evident. And uh, the productivity patterns, you know, like the algal sea production, the primary production in terms of marine algae is affected, it is shifting, it is because it is going to be the uncovered, is being uncovered uh, to a great extent. And the temperatures are ideal for a larger growth of this. So if there are no herbivores, the fast growing species will hamper the growth of the slowly growing forms and this will affect the diversity. So but if there are good herbivory and there is good grazing by them, it will definitely, the diversity component will be good. With the good herbivorous activity, the diversity will be kept up or maintained or it will be better. So, positive effect of warming on species richness in the presence of herbivores, but negative effect in the absence of herbivores. And they have a key role, you know. So, this is uh, what we have around pictures, what we see, you know, the expanding uh, tundra also invite a lot of forages. Uh, we look at uh, this as a, a driver in the microbial change because they are not coming alone. They are coming with a lot of organisms, microorganisms and antibiotic resistant organisms, health significant bacteria. So they are coming into pristine Arctic and we get lots of them and we are actually working, focusing on those lines. So it invites a lot of, you know, it gives an habitat for uh, more foraging species. And methane uh, flux response to permafrost thawing because methane is a very, very potent uh, greenhouse gas. It is almost 30 times effective than CO2 in trapping the heat, trapping the temperature. And uh, these northern wetlands, which actually a big storage house, it's, it actually holds more than 50% of the global soil organic carbon. Due to slow organic carbon decomposition rate, because it is very cold, it is permafrost, it is covered, so it is trapped there. It is a, it's a source, but it is not being used. But this uncovering accelerated temperatures will make it, you know, nice setting for the, the bacteria is there, the methanogens are there, the methanogens are not really acting because the conditions were not very favorable. Now the conditions are becoming favorable and this increase in wetland area will have significant effect on uh, methane emission. Those increased net primary production, vascular plant species composition and soil or water can, could enhance methanogenesis. You can also argue that, you know, like this uncovering also acts as a carbon sink because the, the tundra expanses, the CO2 is being used by the plants for their growth there is, but we have to look at what is the net activity, what is the net emission rates have gone up or not. It is likely they have gone up. And uh, our interest, uh, like, you know, this is, we can see here, this uh, loss of sea ice, which is actually record loss by 2016-17. And this is another uh, forcing mechanism, this great ocean conveyor belt, where we focus on this one, where we can actually see, because water masses have their own distinct uh, microflora. So these warm water incursions to the high Arctic brings in a lot of organisms. And uh, the, the expanding tundra invites a lot of uh, organisms to feed, forage. And so here, they are not coming like that, migratory birds. You know, we are focusing on two migratory birds, basically. One is, this is a swell bird population of barnacle geese, which actually wintering in uh, Scotland, Ireland, England border. Then it comes back, in the summer it comes back to oh, the swell bird, where they breed 
and this is actually their the blood population in the Svalbard only. And uh, you know, there comes after visiting an uh, anthropogenically influenced area considerably and then coming back to this place with a lot of their uh, microbial flora which are uh, in a way very, we have got several uh, strains of E. coli, many of them pathogenic. So we are, our research long term objectives we are actually looking at microbial diversity as a function of climate change. We are looking at whether non-polar species are coming, whether health significant bacteria are coming, whether the warming trends are allowing their survival there. So this is a microbial pro proxy which we choose for looking at the climate changes happening. And the study areas are like Consfuren and Prosfuren and this contributes long-term monitoring studies of your environment by NCR, now NCPR. They are, uh, have a very focused long-term monitoring program. They have uh, uh, moored observatory also which will provide us with the very important uh, physical chemical data because everything is connected. And we also look at uh, the other biological aspects and we have come up with uh, very good publications in this regard. Uh, and short-term objectives are like, well, how do they do, how do they contribute, the cycling of, because the material need to be cycled and there is a large, large, significant uh, amount of uh, stable, structurally stable polysaccharides in the Arctic Ocean. How this warming is helping the microbial communities whether to efficiently degrade them and put them back into production, which is a major, uh, you know, so the storage of stable polysaccharides the degradation of which by microbial communities is being studied by a group, very, very focused studies are going on in that direction. And also, so we look at the three major cycles in this. One is uh, phosphorus because phosphorus regeneration is important. In the winter, the entire thing gets churned up and it's actually being used up. Otherwise, in summer, it is, it is becoming a limiting nutrient. And we are also, we, as I said, in the carbon, we are basically looking at this structurally stable uh, polysaccharides which are a very significant fraction uh, in the in the Arctic uh, ocean sediments. Then the nitrogen, whether heterotrophs are participating in nitrogen fixation. We see, uh, we have some recent publication that in the heterotrophs are also capable of doing nitrogen fixation. From the tropical estuaries, we are looking at whether such genes are there in the Arctic system, uh, which is a, which will be an, another interesting observation. And uh, other thing, uh, what, what we have seen, you know, this is there is an ingre increasing atlantification of the fjord. The fjord, uh, there is a lot of uh, influx of uh, warm Atlantic water mass and this water mass has got a specific uh, microbial signature. Because you can see various white uh, micro microbial signatures of various biomass, I mean water masses. And we could also see in our studies some of the significant mesophilic, uh, health significant mesophilic in, uh, intruders like Enterobacter ludwigis, Tenotrophomonas uh, maltophilia. And we are looking at uh, this one as well as now Arctic 10. Uh, we have a collaboration with Southern Bohemia University, Czech Republic. Recently, last month, one of my researchers presented a finding in the Polar Ecology Conference there because they track the entire route uh, using uh, geolocators and we get the entire data on wherever they are uh, stopping, wherever they are feeding and we also get swabs specific to uh, the bird and we will see how each specific uh, cloacal swab has a microflora which has got uh, the resistance patterns uh, particular to that particular bird and expected signatures of antibiotic disease. What we see here, one thing which we are now, the colistin is considered as a last resort antibiotic. We are finding, uh, we are looking at some genes but we are not getting them in the, we are looking at the plasmid mediator, we are not seeing them there but they are resistant. We have retested and we are now looking at whether efflux mechanisms which are pumping out cholestin and the organism being resistant. And the other, you can also see a lot of non-polar uh, isolates in the polar water, in the water masses in the Arctic, a lot of non-polar uh, and this one is a very typical of Atlantic uh, water mass. And the uh, focus of our research on mesophilic health significant bacteria because the spread of antibiotic resistance to pristine locations is being considered as an issue, being considered as a major issue uh, globally. And we see some signatures, we want to see how extensive is this issue, especially with relation to extended spectrum beta lactam ESBL genes and carbapenems, fluoroquinolones, and cholestin. So here, you see this one, 
we are looking at this bird. We got two two samplings, 2018 and uh, 17. We have got nice samples. Uh, cloacal swabs. We have got the geolocated data, how they have traveled like this or this, and the number of isolates and their drug resistance and all those things. This is a collaboration with Southern Bohemia University. And uh, we need, you know, an improved focus, focus on understanding heterogeneity in, and the drivers of tundra vegetation productivity and responses. To expected warming will be critical to resolving questions of net ecosystem carbon storage and release as the Arctic warms. We need a very important international collaboration to address these issues because uh, individually we are unable to do, we are able to achieve very limited thing, but with networking with uh, good institutions, we'll be able to achieve many of the things. And that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, the last presentation is by Dr. David Molden, uh, Bridging Science and Policy, Articulations for Hindu Kush and Himalaya Countries. <laughs> okay, Excellencies, um, distinguished guests, uh, and I at the outset would like to thank the organizers very much to give me a chance to talk about the Hindu Kush Himalaya. Uh, region, but I think it's totally relevant to this uh, conference here. I think what uh, what we've heard and my key messages are very much in line with uh, what President Grimson was saying. One, there's a lot of learning that can be done, both scientifically and politically, uh, when looking at Himalaya and Arctic. Uh, but the second message is, I mean, you were st stating that India should do more with the Arctic, but I think also that we should also India should also be paying a lot more attention to what's happening in, in the Himalaya region itself. So those are those are my my two uh, big messages. This is uh, the region, right? That that we're, that I'll be talking about the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Um, the um, you know, different than the Arctic because we like to show the verticality, right? The the dimension, the the mountains. So this is the Bay of Bengal, uh, the Kakaburazi in Myanmar, the Brahmaputra River comes down here, the Himalayan Arc that goes over to the Karakoram Range, the Hindu Kush Range, and then the Tibetan Plateau. So it's like it's one big landmass that has, uh, in many ways, historically. Uh, been an, an, an important, uh, how do I call it, land dividing mark between climates, between cultures. But I think nowadays it's an interesting landmass that's actually bringing people closer uh, together. We feel like the Arctic very much, this is not just an asset for Asia, this is a global asset because of the biodiversity, the energy, uh, and the water and food resources as well in this region that needs a lot of attention right now. Uh, and one of the reasons is that there's huge uh, cultural diversity. There, there are different ethnic groups, different peoples with very strong cultural identity. Over a thousand different lang living languages have been identified in this Hindu Kush Himalayan region. You were talking about indigenous people of the Arctic, and it so so much diversity in this region. Lots of traditional knowledge that also we need to learn from. Uh, if we think about biodiversity, uh, four of the 36 global biodiversity hotspots are in this region. Uh, we've lost airborne transmissions are possible in case of chickenpox kind of viruses, but in other cases they need a close proximity because outside the host they can have a very limited existence. Because once they dried up their own, you know, you, you need to get an inhale, you know, to get into the uh, thing. Or otherwise they can't survive. So virus as such is not a serious threat, but uh, there is, uh, you know, skepticism about whether uh, pathogens which of the long past or in the ancient, whether they re-emerge. They're trapped in the, you know, some fixing, some novel genes into harmless organisms and they become, you know, more pathogenic, more virulent and
cuidado. Hello. Hello, my testing. Hello, hello, mic testing, mic testing. Hello, hello, one, two, three, one, two, three, mic test, one, two, three, one, two, three. Hello, hello. Hello, one, two, three, one, two, three, mic test, one, two, three, one, two, three. Hello, 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 one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Hello, hello, mic test, mic test, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Section 2, Geostatistic Relevance of the Arctic. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, mic check. Hello, mic check, one, two, three. Hello, mic check, one, two, three. Hello, hello, one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Hello, hello, Papu Yadav is touching the mic. You will damage the mic. Hey, don't touch. Deputy Director of the United Nations in the Division of Ocean Affairs and the Law of Science. So he'll be presenting a legal perspective on the developments in this region. Uh, before I invite the two speakers and uh, request your engagement with them, uh, there are three points I just wanted to make, uh, not to structure the session, but to, to basically highlight some of the issues which might impinge on the uh, geostrategic implications of the changes in the Arctic region. And uh, I'll, I'd like to uh, deal with this on three dimensions, the environmental, the economic, and the strategic. Now, as far as the environmental perspective is concerned, it's clear from the presentations made in the forenoon that these changes are irreversible. And given the kind of changes which we are seeing and their uh, likely impacts, on the human and the natural systems, not just in the Arctic region, but all across the globe. We are a neighbor. We are not very far away from the Arctic region. In fact, we have another cryosphere in our neighborhood, which is almost similar in nature, and it's also going to be impacted by these changes. So given these changes, the kind of changes, and very large impacts of these changes, on the systems, on the earth system, on the human system, on the natural system. What is it that the global community, international community can do? The, the Arctic region, uh, the countries around the Arctic region have formed a council uh, to, to look at the governance structures that can help mitigate these impacts and maybe address these impacts uh, in some measure. But are there other ways of doing it? In the context of climate change, certainly a beginning has been made in the Paris Agreement, as you might have uh, seen. But it is certainly not enough to 
address the kind of changes which are taking place in the Arctic region in particular. The, uh, the, the country, several countries have uh, come up with their contributions, uh, uh, which are basically a develop, uh, expression of the development strategy which these countries are going to follow. But the future demands that we need to change the orientation of these strategies. Perhaps we need to do much more. What kind of impact these changes are going to have on the development strategy which countries are going to follow in the next decade and the decades to come is something which we need to uh, discuss. Uh, the second issue was economic. What kind of impacts these changes will have on the economic activity? Uh, Dr. Chaturvedi referred to the Arctic paradox in the Konoon. Uh, because the whole uh, the institutional structure of the Arctic Council came up because uh, of the need to promote an ecological uh, cooperation in the Arctic region. But, uh, the, but the things have evolved further. And given uh, the kind of evolution which the Arctic Council has seen, um, now the increasingly uh, the, the focus is also increasingly being given to the economic activities in the region. Uh, President Crimson did discount the, uh, the challenge of the Arctic paradox. He said that the economic progress and uh, the ecological preservation can go hand in hand. Certainly, uh, a large uh, uh, part of the international community does believe in this, and this is the reason why the Paris Agreement was also uh, finally signed. But there, are, uh, th there is clearly no doubt that the kind of economic opportunities which these changes present to us are going to uh, create new challenges as well. The increased mining, increased oil exploration, the uh, opening of a new ship, uh, shipping route, uh, all these are new uh, opportunities, but at the same time new challenges. Uh, should uh, countries invest more in these opportunities? Or should they look at their development strategy in a different manner? To take, uh, to give a small example, uh, energy. Every country looks at the sources of energy and the energy use as part of its development process. And uh, the Arctic region is emerging as a very large reserve, very large source of energy reserves. So should uh, we start investing our energies, our resources, in uh, this kind of? Um, uh, um, resource exploration and uh, resource uh, governance. There are many countries, uh, uh, again, uh, to cite uh, what uh, President Grimson uh, mentioned about the hydropower, the increased potential of hydropower in the region because of the uh, changes and because of the Arctic governance uh, uh, which is in place. But uh, th there are countries which are also looking at other sources of renewables like solar power. Now, countries which are investing in solar power, should they look at continued exploration and continued uh, resource uh, uh, use uh, based on oil and gas and this region? Now, that will be a different kind of story altogether. And it will also have its own strategic implications. So that was the second point which I thought I'll draw your attention to. Uh, the last was the strategic uh, dimension of these changes. Uh, certainly, given these changes, new partnerships will emerge. Uh, Russia and uh, China are now cooperating on a new pipeline. The new shipping lines will open up. Uh, given that, should will the importance of the Indian Ocean as uh, as the primary sea, uh, trading route will it go down? What kind of impact it will have on the uh, states and the countries which dot the Indian Ocean? Will it uh, create a new world order? Uh, will it uh, give rise to further militarization, given the, uh, the, the claims of uh, the Arctic uh, countries and uh, countries which are outside this region? Uh, will the increased Asian uh, involvement with this region give rise to new challenges? All these are uh, things which will have their own strategic implications. I'm sure the experts and the people present here will have more to contribute to this uh, particular issue. So I'll stop here and uh, I'll, uh, we'll listen to the speakers and uh, then we'll uh, look forward to a very uh, 
put discussion on the issue. So we have about, let's see, how much time do we have? Maybe we will uh, I'll, uh, request the speakers to give about uh, their presentations in about 10 to 12 minutes each, and then uh, we'll open the subject for discussion in the house. Thank you. Can I request Mr. Parmar first? YCW for inviting me to make this presentation. I've been a member of the 11th Antarctic Committee, which is known there as the One India Coalition of my heart. I do hope to go to the Arctic sometime, but maybe as a member of the Internet Governance of my geostrategic issues out there. Uh, the Chinese have a saying, may you live in interesting times. I would take that as a curse or a blessing for me. And Kissinger two years back said, we live in dangerous times. So as far as the Arctic is concerned, it's definitely interesting. I do hope it doesn't become dangerous. But what I am about to discuss out there has certain implications. I've called it potential for conflict amongst corporations. This is a takeoff from a commentary I wrote way back in 2012. And I'll just add on to what my thought process was at that point in time. One point here conflict does not necessarily mean force or violence. There are different methods of conflict. Economic warfare is something that you gain potentially from the other. When I say conflict, don't go back to just military on military. And having said that, there is a term which has gained prominence called law. It's a mixture of law and warfare, and I think that is one issue that may hijack the agenda of Arctic in the time to come. Perhaps with the Chinese, we can see how they are on red with this in the South China Sea and now beyond. So I thought, I put my thoughts together and said, what is it that are areas of strategic interest? There may be a mix. The list is longer than what I was going to flash here, but I just thought I'd cover this. One is scientific research. It's definitely common interest at regional, global, and national levels. A lot has been said in the morning, and I think this is something that will continue. And it's definitely one method of conflict in the Arctic in the time to come. Tourism is another issue. Or something has been spoken earlier. If the Antarctic is a national vision, why not the Arctic? And that also will ensure that the potential for conflict in a way gets reduced. Just don't add to it. Race for resources is the key thing. And of course, there's the question of deep sea mining. And after that, when I show you certain maps out there of deep sea mining, it not only requires technology which is for dual purpose, but it also means that you need data for any damage to the environment after we are done with it. And there is nothing very hard on any international level for this to be looked at. It's important for India because in the Central Indian Ocean Basin we have our own area, China is also there as far as I'm aware, but we need to keep this in mind, even if we don't go into the deep mining sector in the near future. Maritime claims is a second concern out there, CSPS is formally discussing and has discussed with the Paris and many other minor points of that. That means are we looking at a redrawing of the maritime map, and therefore is it going to cause more areas of Sea routes, uh, you actually have to see the actual cost benefit. The further you go away from the starting endpoint lines of the sea route, the less cost benefit you have to see. I think for India, my reading is it's not going to be that beneficial for us to do it, but the impact on the Indian Ocean region is something to see. If this is going to result in even a 3-4% reduction in shipping in the Indian Ocean region, mainly due to the following of different shipping routes or the import of oil from the Arctic region, then it becomes easier for us to monitor shipping from this area and what is called maritime shipping in this area. The Indian Ocean region, for example, sees annually 120,000 ships come by. If you are on the AIA, you can see, and you can actually see that there are many 